Ain't nobody had a more interesting and downright bizarre life than those drugged up talented heifers who reigned supreme in the late 70s, 80s. Y'all think the demonized life of a top rated celebrity is bad nowadays? You obviously weren't pushed through the old cooter proper yet because to say a time was bad back in the day would be an understatement. Funk, rock and roll icon and Nicki Minaj's faux mama, Shaka Khan garnered so much buzz when she stepped onto the scene in the 70s. What would have got her canceled expeditiously today, no matter if she was in fact of native ancestry or not, her indigenous Native American getup was a sight for eager eyes. And so were all the jaw-dropping revelations we discovered years down the line. From alleged crisscross action with Whitney Houston to a fatal encounter with Purple Rain's Prince, let's take a deeper look into the intriguing life of Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan. Legend has it, if you say her name three times in a row, she'll appear ready to cuss you out with as much bougie auntie energy she can muster up. Despite quite literally being in her 70s, we gotta hand it to her. Shaka is out here still fine enough to pull every youngin' who just so happens to pass her by. Shaka Khan is one of music's most beloved artists, spawning the disco decade. Bell bottoms took over the city and rock and roll was still hanging on to its last authentic good years. Born Yvette Marie Stevens, the arts was all Shaka was accustomed to. She couldn't escape the creative manifestations of her parents' inventions. The oldest of five, being an artist was something that was embedded into her genes. A bohemian residence out of the mellow city of Chicago, Illinois, Shaka's father jumped onto the minimalist trend before 2018 got the chance to revive it yet again. Except for back then, it was called being a beatnik. A silver spoon was something Shaka could only envision in her mind, cause Lord knows she wasn't born with it. Right smack in the middle of Shy towns madness, religion was something that kept her and her siblings grounded. For the time being, that is. Preferably Catholic, which Shaka later on spoke on referring to herself as a recovering Catholic. Needless to say, those days she spent counting the minutes on the clock in her elementary Catholic school wasn't spent with much joy. Nevertheless, she made it work jazz music, the ease-ridden soft beats of the soothing genre her grandma would often play. By the time she became a preteen, R&B had been her music genre of choice, forming a girl group with her sister called the Crystalettes at just age 11. Music kept her busy during the moment she wasn't attending high school, and by the late 60s, when the pro-black movements held relevant by the ever so controversial Black Panther Party were at its peak, Shaka wanted every part of the revolution. Attending civil rights rallies with her father's second wife, who by this time he'd marry after divorcing Shaka's mother earlier on, would be a frequent bonding moment between the two. After befriending fellow shy native and Black Panther affiliate Fred Hampton, Shaka decided to officially join the Panthers, serving as a newspaper girl during the time she wasn't in school. Which would be often because Shaka supposedly was cutting more classes than an alcoholic taking AA courses. One day while skipping class for the umpteenth time that year, Shaka snuck away to a local university where she and other associates of the Panther Party and anyone else wanting to take part of just skipping class for the heck of it would all come together to watch the Battle of Algiers film. Well, on this certain day, someone ticked off a local policeman who wasn't thrilled to see the body of teens teening away. Before he could really do anything about it, everybody in attendance basically jumped the officer. Shaka snatching up his gun in the midst of the chaos. Joined a band, we started working clubs. Yeah. And I was at like 16, I ran away from home. Who knows whatever she did with it. But being in the Panthers became a little too much for a young Shaka, who decided to sever ties in 1969. She eventually dropped out of Kenwood High, preferring to seek out her goals of becoming a performer. She began by performing in smaller groups around the city, performing with a group called Life that include her then boyfriend, Hassan Khan. The two would eventually tie the knot in 1970, bringing their union to a whole other level, while the union of their band would deteriorate, disbanding altogether the following year. Another group, Rufus, would soon take its place and eventually caught the attention of no other than Fist Fight Ike, Tina Turner's worser half, who then flew them out to LA to record at his Bullock Sound Studio. Word on the street was that Ike had the hots for Miss Shaka, so much so, he wanted her to become an iCat. And we all know what happens to the women that become iCats. And if you don't, then let me tell you, 
There wasn't a whole lot of singing on stage, rather there was much singing once the curtains closed, if you know what I mean. Shaka declined Ike's offer and the recognition definitely gave her a confidence boost. By the time Rufus signed with ABC, their debut album initially failed to gain momentum. But once Stevie Wonder became associated, lending them a song he had wrote, Tell Me Something Good went on to become the group's breakout hit, scoring the third position on Billboard's Hot 100, as well as scoring them their first Grammy Award. Back-to-back -back hits, back-to-back -back recognition, back-to-back -back awards. Shaka and the rest of Rufus were on a high. Not possibly as high as the group was getting back then. Shaka would soon branch off into her own solo endeavors, leaving the group behind in 78. I'm Every Woman was released the following year, catapulting the record to global success. Shaka's debut album would go on to sell over a million copies. I'm Every Woman would later be covered by Whitney Houston, and it'd be just as socially accepted decades down the road. Speaking of Whitney, this is where the story takes a little pearl-clutching turn, because believe it or not, it was alleged that Whitney and Shaka were not only really good friends, but allegedly the two would have full-blown snort sessions. And what will really make you want to go open your jewelry box just to grab more pearls so that you can clutch those as well. Allegedly, on one wild night, Whitney, Bobby, and Shaka were all cozied up in the backseat of a limo when all of a sudden the limo driver heard a few things or uh, sounds in this case. Rumor has it, when the limo driver checked to peep what all the ruckus was about, he saw Whitney, legs spread wide as an eagle, getting devoured by Miss Khan. Y'all must have not heard about the days of Shaka being, allegedly, a wild child. At the young age of 17, Shaka packed up belongings and ran away from home. She and her mama just weren't getting along, so she decided to take her pup and kick rocks. Seeking a payphone that eventually came into view, Shaka called her cousin, asking for her father's whereabouts since she hadn't seen the man in years. Given he done hopped and skedaddled over to Europe with his new wife and ain't told nobody nothing when he got back. But Shaka heard he was back in the States and wanted to know where. She got the info from her cousin, set out on a journey to find her dad's residence, which surprisingly wasn't too far away from where she and this payphone were, and lived with her dad for quite some time. Shaka had been working all throughout the 90s and in 2011 got her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 2015, she became a contestant on ABC's Dancing with the Stars and was eliminated the first night. She'd soon enter rehab just one year later. Heroin and cocaine reportedly ended in the early 90s, but from what we could tell, I honestly wonder just how true that statement is. Given her performance in 2021's Versus Battle against Stephanie Mills, we don't know what to call it, given that she herself claims to have cut out all alcohol consumption in 2005. And thanks to the indulgence of certain drugs, for years Shaka has told the story of a supposed shadow man following her everywhere she went. And no, we're not making this stuff up. Shaka says a shadow figure would practically stalk her every move. Even in hotels, the shadow man would be sitting in the chair in the receptionist lobby or come through the curtains of her hotel windows no matter how high up she was. And oh, you bet she was high. High as a kite? The shadow man would get ghosts once Shaka came across her guardian angel who told the artist either change your life around or get axed. Needless to say, Shaka turned her life around. The Shadow Man followed her all throughout her tour, but ceased once the drug usage and negative thoughts decreased. Speaking of her tour, Shaka and the ever so androgynous Prince toured together for a while. Contrary to popular belief, Shaka was not giving up the goods to no Prince. In fact, Shaka claims that Prince never tickled her cookie and even says she definitely wasn't laying down with him after reading an article that claimed Prince had contracted herpes. Y'all didn't hear this from me. But supposedly Shaka was also the one who introduced Prince to the drug that eventually took him right out of this realm. We're not saying Shaka Khan unalived Prince, so don't go around spreading that rumor and using true celebrity stories as your source of reference, cause you ain't heard that from us. Shaka Khan is one of the most awarded acts of our time. A funktastic living legend whose beauty has withstood the test of time right along with her music that continues to be adored globally and now attached to the playlist of those still honoring the legacy of those spotless cleanup days. She'll cuss you out and pretend like she didn't do it. 
but nothing is as sharp as Shaka's legacy that continues to reign, and even will after she's long gone. Is it about time we give Shaka her flowers? Let us know your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments, and stay tuned for more true celebrity stories.